Hey folks, welcome to Module 10, The Franchise Awakens. Let's go to Welcome to the Mouse House. So in 2012, George Lucas sold Lucasfilm to Disney. He had his reasons. He was old, he was getting remarried, and starting another family. He was tired. He had already handed the reins of the live-action unit to Kathleen Kennedy, who was Spielberg's longtime producer, and had Dave Filoni in place directing the animated division. He also wrote three treatments with the help of Michael Arndt, who wrote Toy, Toy Story 3, uh, which were part of the deal, even though Disney really wanted everything but new stories from George. Um, now Disney had Pixar, Marvel, and Star Wars, and they were truly an unstoppable monolithic juggernaut, exactly the thing Lucas had been fighting against his entire career. But he did make a cool $4 billion, which has actually turned into more like 10 since he got half of it in stock. And since the sale, we've had pretty much three quarters of the uh, Marvel Universe uh, films as well as um, all the Star Wars films. So um, it was definitely a good deal for George Lucas uh, monetarily. So the first thing Disney did was fire Michael Arndt. Um, and he had already written the first draft of episode seven and uh, parts of that ended up in the final film. Uh, and they replaced him with Lawrence Kasdan and J.J. Abrams, um, who always monkeys around with the scripts of the films he directs. Um, so most of Lucas's story ideas went out the window, most but not all. Um, so they're starting out fresh, sort of. But, you know, how do you create... Um, or how do you begin a new trilogy without repeating the mistakes of The Phantom Menace, uh, which is enough to scare anyone? Um, well, you, you get J.J. Abrams from the Star Trek franchise, which is like kaput now, because um, after all, he is the baby Spielberg. Um, you grab Lawrence Kasdan, uh, who was the best Star Wars writer from the first trilogy, uh, and you basically redo episode four, you know, Star Wars, but with new characters and old ones. And at the end, you blow up the Death Star again. Oops. It's not a Death Star, okay? And no spoilers, no spoilers here. Um, whatever you do, you have to have the big three. You got to have Luke, Leia, and Han. Um, and it would be the big six, but I guess Chewie, R2, and C-3PO don't really count because they aren't human. You know, they don't deserve medals or anything like that. Um, you make it deadly serious, but you throw in a healthy dose of humor. Um, you make it big and epic, uh, but moving at a brisk, brisk pace. I uh, use the perfect blend of genres, which is, as we know, it's all of them. Um, it's easy peasy, right? So the notes for The Force Awakens. So it was directed by J.J. Abrams, who also did um, Super 8. Um, of course, he was one of the showrunners of Lost, a uh, fair number of other films as well. Uh, it was written by Lawrence Kasdan, uh, Michael Arndt, and J.J. Abrams. And its budget was $245 million. And uh, at the box office, it made uh, $935 million domestic and $2 billion worldwide. And it also had the biggest opening weekend of all time until um, the Avengers Infinity War happened. And that kind of knocked it off its pedestal. Um, so it was the first Star Wars film in a decade, uh, the first outing under Disney, and without George Lucas, so no pressure, right? Our synopsis, 30 years after the defeat of the Empire, uh, according to IMDb, I wasn't really sure. Uh, I thought it was like 28, but whatever. Um, a young scavenger girl on a desert planet that totally isn't Tatooine discovers a droid carrying a secret map leading to the long-lost Jedi that everybody wants to find. After joining up with a former stormtrooper and stealing a crappy old ship, the Millennium Falcon, uh, she ends up smack dab in the middle of a new rebellion against a rebranded evil empire called the First Order, who have built a super secret planet-destroying base that is totally not a new Death Star. And Darth Vader's angsty grandson is also involved um, in all this in a major way. And I try to do that with as few spoilers as possible, but th there's still going to be a few. So I'm adding a critical analysis here just because I have to. Um, with some of the other ones, I put it someplace else. You'll, you'll see next week. Um, so there are mild spoilers here. So The Force Awakens is uh, an enjoyable film, if you don't think too hard. Uh, it picks up at a suitable distance from The Return of the Jedi, and it stops at a pretty awesome cliffhanger, literally, kind of. Um, but it does feel like an unconscious or conscious attempt not to do too much, to not F up the formula. 
Um, but of course, Star Wars was never about playing it safe, except for Return of the Jedi, which was kind of known for that. Um, so it's kind of like what would happen if Disney got a hold of the Star Wars franchise. Hmm. Okay. Um, so what it does right. It returns to its roots. Uh, the desert, of course, but this time, you know, no pod racing. It places Leia front and center of the rebellion where, where she should be. And yes, there is still a rebellion going on because blowing up two Death Stars is not enough to stop evil from prevailing. We know this. Um, comes up with damn good, good excuse why Han and Chewie live in exile. No spoilers. Well, I mean, a little bit of a spoiler there. Uh, it makes the evil empire evil in new ways. They don't just blow up planets. They also kidnap and brainwash kids. Damn it. Um, gives us some new characters. Ray, Poe, Finn, uh, Maz, Kylo, Admiral Hux. Hugs. It's a joke from the next movie. Uh, Jess Pava, also known as Blue 3. Captain Phasma, Stormtrooper Daniel Craig. Yeah, I forget which one. He's like in the interrogation scene, I think, when they're interrogating Ray. Daniel Craig's there. I think maybe she, he's the one that she uses the Jedi mind trick on. Oops, sorry. Spoilers. Um, what it does wrong, um, it's too reverent sometimes. It's like a lame cover of an awesome song because the new singer is too much of a fan of the old one to really try something new. Um, Star Killer bass, I mean, really? Um, it gives us a new hologram boss villain named Snoke that never fully materializes into a complete character. And, you know, we've got Andy Serkis doing it and whatever. Um, leaves a lot of dangling plots and subplots that the next writer director had no plan to resolve, which we'll talk about next week. Um, and it creates the beginnings of multiple potential romantic ships that will never get to dock. Uh, we've got Finn Ray, and we can't have that because it's Disney. Uh, we've got Finn Poe, because this is Disney. And then we've got Blue Ray, um, because Blue 3 let it slip that she was almost cast in the lead. But of course, she couldn't be because this is Disney. So we've got all these ships, and most of them involve Finn. I guess all, or most of them involve Ray too, but none of them can ever happen because this is Disney. 